He's interviewing actor Chuck, actor Vincent Price here in Chicago, talking about uh, radio. Uh, Vincent Price died in 1993 at the age of 82. He was 60 when this uh, interview was recorded. Chuck told me privately that uh, Vincent Price was in town to promote something he was doing for Sears. Some, I think he was he was the art consultant for uh, art that Sears was Sears Robic was selling. And Chuck, to his credit, thought that he should. Uh, he should ask Vincent Price something about, uh, you know, his relationship with Sears. That's that's the reason for his tour. And to Vincent Price's credit, he said, no, I'd rather talk about radio. So <laughs> here are Vincent Price and Chuck Shaden talking about radio in uh, 1971. Our guest today is a man who is respected as one of the country's leading art experts and as one of our leading actors, too. His characterizations and scores of Fine, tingling dramas has left audiences gasping around the world. And many of our good old radio listeners will remember him from appearances in dozens and dozens of radio anthology series as well. In one radio series, he was Simon Templer, the Robin Hood of modern crime, playing a saint rather than a sinner. He's Vincent Price. Welcome, Mr. Price, to Those Were the Days. How are you? I'm fine. Uh, I'm glad delighted to be here. I love to talk about radio. Well, great. We're going to zero in on radio then okay. for a little while today. You know, people uh, tend to associate you always with the horror films you've made and uh, forget perhaps uh, so much that you've done on on radio and uh, and also some of the things you've done in motion pictures that really weren't at all related to uh, the horror films, especially when I remember when uh, so many of the films you made for 20th Century Fox and the uh, I think it was about early 1940s or so. Well, 1940s and 50s. Actually, I, I never did a horror film until about 1955. And I did one called The House of Wax, which was a tremendous success. And um, I've done a few since then. But out of the 100 films I've done, only about 20 of them have been horror films. The ones I like to remember, which fortunately are still on television, uh -huh. are, are some of the ones I did at Fox, like Laura and Song of Bernadette and Keys to the Kingdom, those pictures. You uh, you may not have actually been in what is uh, called a horror film uh, in, in some of the uh, the early pictures that you did, but uh, many of them were uh, uh, spooky films or scary pictures, uh, things like... Uh, they were really more melodramas, uh, some of them, yeah. Right. And uh, the first one I did really was not in the movies, but in the theater. I did a play that was a very famous play and ran forever in New York called Angel Street which was about a fellow who tried to drive his wife mad, and um, it was an, a very exciting play. The film was Gaslight. Gaslight, yeah. that's right. Before you uh, started your motion picture career, you were quite an established uh, actor on the stage. Yes, uh, I did a play with Helen Hayes, which mm -hmm. ran for three years in New York, and then uh, Angel Street ran a couple of years, and I did a lot of plays with Orson Welles in the Mercury Theater, and I still do a lot of theater. You do? Yeah, I try to do one every year. Last year I did Oliver, the musical. Had a wonderful time during that. Gee, well, I hope that you, your stage roles will bring you to Chicago one day so we can well, get a chance to see you on the board, so to speak. I was asked to do Sleuth here, as a matter of fact, oh. and it's, it's one of the most exciting plays I've ever seen. I think you all will love it here. Well, we'll look forward to seeing you. Uh, no, I can't, I can't do it, unfortunately. I've got a commitment to do a film. Well, there's another year. Yeah. Another year, <laughs> another, another play. Another play. Uh, you mentioned the House of Wax a moment ago. That that actually was a uh, a, a remake of a, of an old Lionel Atwill. That's film. right. Uh, I think it was called the Mystery the of the Mystery Wax. Mystery of the Museum. Wax Museum, and then they called it uh, in my version, which was in 3D, mm. the House of Wax. And um, actually, it was one of the biggest money makers of all time. That gimmick with the glasses and everything. Uh -huh really caught hold, and unfortunately it was uncomfortable for people to wear the glasses, so 3D went out. But, you know, it was uh, amazingly, I, I've seen the film since seeing it in the theater in yeah. 3D. I've seen it on television many times. Yeah. And uh, the impact of the film was not lost just because you lose the 3D. No, it really wasn't. It. One of the reasons, I think, was that the director, Andre de Toff, didn't make it just for the gimmicks. You know, he made it as a very, very good film, and uh, consequently, when you see it without 3D, it's just as good. But the best 3D effect in it was the uh, the fellow with the ping uh, pong ball. The ping pong. Yes, uh, that was thing. marvelous. Yeah. yeah, that was really really something. Uh, 
your latest film is Dr. Fives, and you've got a sequel coming up. Yes, I don't know what they're going to call it yet. Uh, Dr. Fives really sort of calls for a sequel. There are few films that do, but it really does, because uh, there was one thing left undone mm -hmm. in this film. You know, I'd like to get back to radio, because well, so uh, would I. I, I think that radio was probably one of the most exciting medias that, that ever was. The audience had to do a lot of work. I, I did a great many uh, oh, suspense and escape and all of mm -hmm. those theaters, uh, radio theaters. And the audience really had to build the sets, to create the makeup, to uh, figure out what they thought the people were like, what the ambiance of the, uh, of the drama was like. It was terribly exciting. And almost everybody that I've ever known who started in the theater, uh, who, who has made a success in the theater, started in radio. Radio was the greatest training ground for actors, I think, that ever was. Did you uh, get involved in radio through Orson Welles and his Mercury Theater on the air? No, I was with Orson before the Mercury mm -hmm. Theater on the air. I did a lot of soap operas uh, when I was playing in plays in New York. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was a way of training, really. I mean, you'd go in and you'd do these things, John's other wife and Sam's other mother, and, you know, they were uh, they were marvelous fun, though, and they called for a kind of immediate, almost improvisation that was very exciting. Everybody I know really feels that radio was one of the great dramatic mediums. It is. Yeah. It is. And when we hear today some of the programs that were produced for radio 25 and 30 years yes. ago, they still hold up. They oh, they stand sure up do. very well. I did one called Three Skeleton Key about three men who were trapped in a lighthouse when the rats invaded this little island. That still is one of the most exciting shows, I think, that I've ever done in my life. It was just tremendously thrilling. You used uh, your uh, radio skills, if that's what we can call them. You used your acting skills yeah. on radio, I should say, uh, many, many times, and you appeared... Uh, quite frequently on the Screen Guild Players yes. the program and uh, uh, the Philip Morris Playhouse, too. I oh, yes. You, you were I did uh, ten of those with Tallulah Bankhead. <laughs> they, were, they were kind of an experience, I'll tell you. <laughs> Working with Tallulah? Was yeah, oh, well, she was marvelous. She really was. I had the greatest admiration for this woman. And you played a uh, continuing character for a while in The Saints. Yes. Uh, for three years, I did. Three years? Say. Yeah. Uh, it was... a. Uh, it was a challenge that I wanted very much at that point in my career to try and create somebody, you know, I mean, completely. Mm -hmm. I'm not really that interested in doing that kind of a thing in television. The mm -hmm. Saint had a lot more dimensions than you're allowed in television as a character. Uh, you're visual, and therefore you're limited, but in, in, a, in a radio drama, you can create anything you want. And uh, it has more excitement, really, as an acting medium. And all you have to do is blink your eyes to uh, change the set, as you That's say. That's right. Absolutely. Which was, uh, when, when exactly did you get involved in radio? What, what point was it? Was it 39 or 40? Or well, I started in the theater in 1935, mm -hmm. and I started in London, though I'm an American. Mm -hmm. But I did some radio over there, and radio is still a very, very big medium in, in England. Uh, the BBC does brilliant dramas and marvelous music and... Uh, uh, dramatizations of the lives of different people as they have done recently mm -hmm. on television. Mm -hmm. And um, then I came over here and went in the theater, and I felt that I needed radio as an extension. And um, I started right away, about 1937, doing radio. Mm -hmm. And you've, you've actually been uh, associated with radio right right up until your, I, I guess, most of the time that you had that was extra was spent on television. Then. Yes, and I still do radio. I... I uh, uh, every chance I get. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, now it's cut down to a place where you really don't have time to do mm -hmm. it. There are too many commercials. And uh, I remember during the time that radio was sort of drifting out and television was drifting in in Hollywood, uh, we would do remakes of the great shows that we had done in the great days mm -hmm. of radio. And they would be cut so and interfered so by the by the commercial that they lost their impact. Because radio has a continuity that is just marvelous, mm -hmm. as a play does, you know, three acts. I miss it very much. What is, is there really anything going on in radio today as far as uh, drama is concerned? No. Mm -hmm. There's just 48 hours of news every 24. 
<laughs> if if someone were to uh, come up, I, I ask this of many of our guests uh, who fondly remember radio yes. as you do. If if some someone came up with a a good playhouse on the air again today, uh, two questions: Would you do you think that it would it would go? Do you think it would be accepted by the large listening audience today? And secondly, would you like to be a part of it? I would like to be a part of it, first of all. I, I'm not sure it would. I think um, that people now are visually oriented and have been a bit visually put upon. I don't think television has really lived up to its promise. It could be one of the great medias of all time because it's got voice and it's got picture and it's got everything going for it. But so much of the programming is really so inferior and they don't do anything about education. Uh, when we did the CBS workshop and things like that in radio, we dramatized all the great novels. Um, I would do plays with Ruth Gordon and people like this, and uh, we'd do Ibsen and Shakespeare, and there was this marvelous thing of the audience being a captive audience of, by their own volition. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I don't know whether you could do that anymore. I mean, we're oriented now to turning on the radio to find out whether the freeway is jammed, I don't know whether people would really listen. I would, but I'm we, not sure. We, we play uh, large slices of good old radio every week on this show, mm -hmm. and um, we've found that people do listen yes. and uh, enjoy the uh, the vintage radio programs again. Uh, most generally, the reaction is it's very difficult the first time we hear one or two of these shows because we're trained not to use the imagination. Yeah. But if you stick with it for a couple of hours, not necessarily, necessarily all at once, yeah. those those imagination buds start, start working, working again. Absolutely. I, I think, you know, people like Jack Benny, I, I did several shows with Jack, both on TV and radio, but I always felt that he was one of the great radio people, mm -hmm. and I don't think he ever really lived up to it as much in television. Uh, there was a magic about that voice and the pauses and the, you know, everything he did. Well, the so vault, the, his vault, for oh, example. Yes, it was you know, marvelous. They he never could picture No. Never. Never could recreate no, it. On, on never. Uh, you're in Chicago this week to uh, herald the opening of uh, another Vincent Price Sears art gallery? Is that no, it? no, actually, um, Sears is a, a very adventurous company. They feel an obligation towards their enormous public, and they have mm -hmm. the public. And they're starting a, a home decorating school, which they hope will introduce people to new ideas in decoration, to uh, saving the young homemaker the, the mistakes that they make by lack of knowledge of, mm -hmm. of decoration, of the great periods of art. I think the reason they brought me into it is that I'm a fellow who believes that art is everything. I don't believe it's just those things hanging in the Chicago Art Institute. I think mm. furniture can be a great art, and um, fabrics and all of the things that go into a home are very important that you know something about them. And this course will be open to the public. It's a very nominal fee. Mm -hmm. And they give away samples and a, a place so that you can plan the position of your furniture and show you the, here, the periods of design and everything. I think it's a very exciting idea and can lead people to doing more interesting things because as we become more and more at leisure, which we will do in this country, uh, there will have to be shorter working hours and working days of the week, the home is going to become the great center of American living. And I think people are tired of bad taste, and they should know a little bit about what is good taste. Well, you've uh, been a leader in good taste for a long time with, with your art interests and uh, so many other things. I think that you'll help show them the way. Oh, thank you. Uh, my wife and I uh, wrote a cookbook a few years ago that uh, we've been kind of amazed at the impact of it. It sold about a quarter of a million copies, and... Uh, we photographed our own home, which is a mm -hmm. real do-it-yourself effort. Everything in it is something that we have done and that we have found inexpensively in, in out-of-the-way places. And I don't mean out-of-the-way in India mm -hmm. or something, no, but no. just by looking and by knowing about what we want in our home. We have uh, that cookbook 
in our home. Do you? Oh, I'm delighted. I want to thank you for some very fine meals, too. Oh, the recipes are marvelous. <laughs> very good. A treasury of great recipes. After uh, the sequel to Dr. Five, what happens for Vincent Price? Well, I uh, I really don't know. You never know in, in my profession. I'm, uh, I go out on a lecture tour every year, and I, I think that's one of the most exciting things I do. I've been in over 350 cities in the country, about 250 colleges, and I find America stimulating and exciting, and right now I think that all of us must do something for our country because we're in great danger. Uh, we're in great danger as far as our world reputation is concerned. We must concern ourselves with the arts, with civilization, and uh, this is sort of my message as I go around the country. So I, I do that every year. I'm going to do that in February. Well, you're spreading your message today on our program. Oh, thank and you. Thank you very much for spending a few moments with us and my reminiscing pleasure. about radio. And uh, we think that you're stimulating and exciting, and uh, your contributions to radio and to motion pictures and television, too, have been major, and we thank you for that. Oh, thank you very much. Lovely being with you. Thank you, Vincent Price. Thanks.